Now, this evening, I'm going to be speaking about something different because there is this global anger and hatred that's broken out right across this world. And I, it's the largest global shift in culture. It's the kind of shift in culture you see normally every three to 400 years. And I can't believe I get to witness some of it, and I can't believe how global it is. Now, it manifests itself in different cultures in different ways, and we'll be looking at that this evening. But you, we see it everywhere. I was reading an editorial in a newspaper just a couple of, um, um, uh, a few months ago, and every so often you read something in the paper, you think this is brilliant. But let me just read to you what this guy wrote. He said, what we're witnessing throughout the West is a new politics of anger. There's anger at the spread of unemployment, leaving whole regions and, and generations bereft of hope. There's anger at financiers who brought the global economy to the brink of disaster and yet continue to reward themselves as if nothing has happened. There's anger at CEOs using public corporations for private be benefit. There's anger that while a few have benefited disproportionately from the global economy. Most have seen their standards of living static, say static, or decline. There's a widespread feeling that the world of the 21st century is spinning out of control. It's led to the resurgence of a dangerous forces, the far right seeking a return to a golden age that never was, the far left in pursuit of a utopia that will never be. They are both enemies of freedom. W.B. Yeats's vision is finally coming to pass. The center no longer holds, things fall apart, and anarchy is loosed upon the way. But there is something deeper behind the dysfunctional politics of contemporary West. For the past half a century, we've been through one of the most great unstated social experiments of all time. We've tried to construct a world without identity and without morality. Instead, we've left it to two systems to deal with the problems of our collective life, the market economy and the liberal democratic state. The market Morality has been outsourced to the market. The market gives us choices, and morality has been reduced to a set of choices in which right and wrong have no meaning beyond the satisfaction or frustration of our own desires. We find it increasingly hard to believe and understand that there are things we might want to do, we can afford to do, but we shouldn't do because they are dishonorable, disloyal, dismeaning, or demeaning, in a word, unethical. Too many people in positions of public trust have come to the conclusion that if you can get away with it, you'll be a fool not to do it. And that is how elites betray the public they were meant to serve. And when that happens, trust collapses and a civilization begins to decay and to die. Meanwhile, the liberal democratic state has abolished national identity in favor of multiculturalism, and the effect is to turn society from a home into a hotel. In a hotel, you pay the price, you get a room, and you're free to do what you like, so long as you do not disturb the other guests, but in a hotel, but a hotel is not a home. It doesn't generate identity or a sense of belonging. And that's the world we live. And it's partly because of this, and this is what I'll be speaking about tonight. This is why the three most powerful words in the English language are, I am offended. Because we all feel the right to be angry, and we'll be speaking about that tonight. And I, I want to flag that up now, because what I'm going to speak to you next is going to seem very, very scary, I know, for a lot of you. But I want to try to encourage you with it. And so I'm not one, I don't want to duck this difficult issue of how our global culture has suddenly shifted and we now are all suddenly living in fear of causing offense to someone else, and how do we engage with that? So I want to talk about that, but I want to start somewhere slightly more basic. And I'm going to be talking to you out of a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be um, from verse uh, 15 onwards. I'm going to read that to you in a little bit, but I want to start with a, with a separate word of personal testimony about a huge revolution in my life. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in a Christian culture. Um, I didn't come from a Christian background. So I got to hear nothing about the gospel, really, until... My parents left um, the Middle East, and we moved out of Saudi Arabia, and we went to a country called Cyprus, and there I met Christians for the first time. And they were an amazing group of people. I fell in love with them. I used to ask them incessant questions, and eventually that led through me coming to the conclusion that this is true and real. Now, after I became a Christian, I wanted to tell everybody what happened to me. I wanted to share it with everybody. Everywhere I went, I wanted to say, look, this is what has happened to me. This is what, this is what can happen to you. And I used to try to drag people along to come to my church, which wasn't such a great idea. Um, it wasn't a very lively church, let's just say, actually, it was largely dead. Um, uh, so that wasn't very effective. Then I tried to get people to listen to stuff. I'd give them tapes and say, look, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. And occasionally they would, but most people were too busy to listen to anything. So that wasn't working either. And then one day, several years later, I discovered this radical new way of sharing the gospel with people. I was living at that point, I'd moved, I was now in the UK, and I was living really in many senses what is the cultural epicenter of Great Britain, a town called Worksop in North Nottinghamshire, a small ex-mining coal, coal mining community which at the time had 25% unemployment, I don't know what it is now. And so there I am and I'm, I'm teaching there, I'm doing some research there, my wife and I make our home, well, make, had made our home there at that time, and I had been invited to go and speak in America. Now, if you're new to the church and you haven't visited here, 
Um, and here's what you need to know if you're a Christian and you want to go and speak in America. There are two basic requirements which you must fulfill. You must have good hair and good teeth. Now, <laughs> making the teeth look good, that's a very expensive thing and it can't be done at short notice, but my hair could be fixed. At that point, I used to have my hair cut when I couldn't comb it. That's when I knew I needed to have it cut. And so I got to that point where it couldn't be cut anymore. So, or combed anymore. So I walked 100 yards down the road on which I lived and I came to the corner to a small place called Belinda's, a small hairdressing salon I'd never been in there before. I walked in, and as I walked in, on my right was a tiny little desk with a very tall, very blonde, and very pregnant lady standing behind it who smiled at me, and she said, how can I help you? And I said, well, I've come to have a haircut. And she produced an appointment book. She said, when were you thinking of coming? And I said, now. <laughs> I, 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 I'm coming now. And so she looked at the book, she looked at me, she said, if, I can, if we're quick, I can squeeze you in. I said, that's not a problem, I don't have a hairstyle, I just have hair, and it needs to be shorter than it is right now. <laughs> so she sat me in a chair, she put an apron thing around me, and she walked off, and she picked up a comb and a scissors, she came and stood behind me, and as she stood behind me, she looked to the lady cutting hair next to her, and she said, my business is doing so well, but there must be more to life than this. And so now she turns to cut my hair, and of course, you've got the giant mirror in front of you, so I can see her standing right behind me. So I just catch her eye in the mirror, and I say, you know, what you say is very true. In life, we're not made happy by what we acquire, but by what we appreciate. And she just sort of froze and st stared at me, and she said, what did you say? I said, well, in life, we're not made happy by what we acquire, but by what we appreciate. And she walked off, and she came back with her notebook, her appointment book, and the pen, and she said, can you say that one more time? And she wrote it down, and then she put down the, the, the notebook and the pen, and she picked up the comb and the scissors. And she obviously seemed to be interested, so I thought, I think I'll follow through. And I said, but if you ask me, the trouble we have today as a people is it's not that we have nothing to be grateful for. Rather, we feel ultimately there's no one to be grateful to. And she put down the comb and the scissors, and she picked up the appointment <laughs> book and her pen, and she said, you couldn't say that again, could you? It took her an hour and 15 minutes to cut my hair. I'd been asked to speak in my small little local church um, that Sunday about worship, and so I'd been thinking about worship. And, and so I, I thought, you know what, there's something I was reading a couple of days ago that I can share with her. And I said, tell me, have you ever been in love with someone and unable to tell them? And she said, I have. I said, it's an awful feeling. She said, it's the worst feeling in the world. I said, but if you're in love with someone and you can tell them, they, you, I love you, and they reciprocate it back, I love you, it brings a completeness which otherwise was missing. She said, I know exactly what you mean. So I smiled. I said, that's why worship is so important to me as a human being. I said, I go to the uh, Christian church just around the corner from here. I said, I find worship brings a completeness to my life which would otherwise be missing. And she wrote all of this down, and, then, and then, 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 then she said, Michael, I'm so worried about bringing a baby into a world which is filled with so much evil. So borrowing a line I'd heard from my boss, Ravi Zacharias, who'd actually borrowed it from someone else, I looked at her and I said, I know there's so much evil out there, but what about the evil in here? And she sighed, and she said, if there was a way to overcome evil in the human heart, that would be amazing. I said, it's interesting you say that. <laughs> I, said, I said, I think all of us want to be good people, but we struggle, we find it so hard. And she said, yes, I want to be a better person. She said, but I feel like there's something within me that's somehow stopping me. I said, well, the Bible calls that sin. Sin isn't just something which we do. It's, it's like a power that has control over our life. And she said, oh, that makes sense. She said, I'm, I really want to be a good person, but I keep, I keep failing. I'm not doing it. She said, I almost feel like I need to be rescued. So I smiled and I said, what you're telling me is you need a savior. And I'm not joking. She looked at me, smiled and went, ooh, that's a good word. <laughs> because... I mean, works up that nobody, this is before the Matrix, if you see them, nobody used the word savior. You know, I mean, you know, who uses that word? She went, ooh, that's a good word. And so then we started talking about who Jesus Christ is and the fact he is the savior of the world. And he came into this world without sin and therefore was free of the power of sin and death. And he came into our life to break that power over our lives and actually give us freedom and through his resurrection and so on. I spent one hour, 15 minutes, she wrote everything down. And I went home at that, that day before I had to then rush off to get uh, my flight. And I, I said, told my wife what happened. And we got down on our knees in our front room and we prayed for this lady. And then when I got back uh, from the States about a week later, I, I said to my wife, I need, how do I follow her up? So I went back for a second haircut. It's the shortest hair I've ever had in my whole life. I walked in. She didn't even ask if I wanted a haircut. She said, Michael, I will cut your hair. She sat me in the chair, came and stood behind me and said, do you remember the conversation we had last week? And I said, yeah, sort of. <laughs> and she said, well, I went home and I told my husband everything you told me. And I thought, this will be interesting. So I said to her, well, what did your husband say? And her mouth literally went, she went, he told me I was preaching at him. Well, of course she was preaching at him. She gets home from work. He gets home from work. They sit down at the dinner table. Out comes the notebook. 
Do you know in life you're not made happy by what you acquire, but by what you appreciate? It's not that you have nothing to be grateful for. You have no one to be grateful to. That's why worship is so important. There's a lot of evil out there, you know, but what about the evil in here? The Bible calls it sin, and that's why you need a savior. Now, what's the difference between these two conversations? So, and the answer is actually really very simple. She was asking a question. When she said, there must be more to life than this, that's not a statement, that's a question. It's a cry of the heart. Is this it? Is there anything more to life than this? That was the question. She was asking a question, and all I was doing was answering it. He hadn't asked anything at all. He just had a huge information dump put on him. And that day, I learned a radical, revolutionary, new way of doing mission that will totally transform the life of the church. It's called talking to people. Now, you're doing this hundred parties thing, right? So as I'm talking to you, I want you to have that vision of the hundred parties in front of you as we talk about, because the Bible envisions every single Christian, every person who is a member of a church being able to talk to people meaningfully about their faith. That is the vision. The question is, can we? Can we do that? Are we able to talk with people and in a, in a very straightforward way, sort of acknowledging so often when we think about sharing our faith with people, we pick on a non-Christian victim and we start praying for them. And then we, one day we just suddenly launch out from nowhere. But so often what we're asked to do is to simply talk to people and acknowledge. God asks us to acknowledge him in all of your ways. What did you do last weekend? Conversation, Monday morning, when you got in from work. Oh, so had a quiet night on Friday. We we're so tired. We had friends around for dinner on Saturday and this and this. I went to church on Sunday. They had this you know, visiting speaker from Oxford who's slightly more boring than normal, and, you know, um, you know, and then we spent some family time in the afternoon, and, and we saw that new movie that's just come out on Netflix. And they might say to you, oh, did you like the Netflix movie? Or they might say to you, you went to church on Sunday? I didn't know that. You, it's just a question of just opening up our lives with people just sharing and just allowing them. But we're scared. Now, in the West, we're scared of causing offense, or sometimes we're scared of being embarrassed. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. And just before that, it says, do not be frightened. Do not fear what they fear. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. The vision in the book of Peter is actually very simple. This little book, this little letter, 1 Peter, that was written to the entire church across this massive geographical region, is basically saying to Christians, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there are two very basic things you need to be clear about. Number one, Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. That's not like an optional extra in the Christian life. It's basic. And, not, and, and if you've got the time, but and, you be ready to speak to people about why you believe what you believe. And that's the vision. Now, it's not the only thing we do, but it has to be a central part we do. So here's my question to you if you're a Christian. If someone came to you and said, why are you a Christian? Could you answer that question for them? Have you ever noticed when people ask us, why are you a Christian? We respond by saying how we became a Christian. You know, why are you a Christian? Well, I met this person. They were really nice. They invited me to their church. I went to this course. They had a weekend away. And during the weekend away, I became a Christian. Now, I want you to imagine you're a pagan for a minute, okay? Non-Christian, non-believer, not yet believer, whatever you want, you know, or worshiper of whatever. So imagine you're not a Christian. Some, they say to you, you, they, they, some, you say to someone, why are you a Christian? And they say how they became a Christian. What does that sound like? Feel free to be Pentecostal on me and yell at me. Most people yell at me often in disagreement. But, okay, it sounds like a sight that you've sidestepped, that you've avoided it. But even worse than that, sounds like you've been brainwashed, doesn't it? Doesn't it just sound like a random encounter? If you'd met a Buddhist that day, you'd have done the Just Zen course, and on the Zen weekend away, you'll be a Buddhist. So it sounds like chance and brainwashing. I'm good friends with a Christian guy called um, J. John, because we both have Greek mothers, and we sometimes do stuff together, and we love having meals together. And when he got converted, his, when he became a Christian, his... Greek mother came to him and said, John, you've been brainwashed. And he said, Mom, if you knew it was in my brain, you'll be glad it's been washed. <laughs> but that's, that's, that doesn't explain how we become Christians. Christians isn't, if you get a successful combination of chance and brainwashing, then you get conversion. That's not what becoming a Christian is. Becoming a Christian is a real and truthful encounter with the person of Jesus Christ, which is why you can ask questions. How do we find out if something's true? 
We ask questions. How do we figure out if it's real and authentic? Well, we, we ask questions. We fill in a world filled with questions. There was research done in 2015, Talking Jesus. Have you talked about that here at all or whatever? If you're not familiar with the research, some, some research was done by Gallup for the heads of the major denominations of the Christian churches in the UK. The, the results seemed so wrong that they, they told Gallup, you've got it wrong, go and do a much bigger survey with a much larger sample size because these numbers must be wrong. And Gallup said, you're wasting your time and your money, but they took it. And they got exactly the same results again within a 1% variation. You know what they discovered? What this Gallup survey showed is that the overwhelming majority of people in, in this country are hoping they can have a conversation with someone about God and Jesus and what does it actually mean to be a Christian. Do you know that? The overwhelming majority, a huge, you're talking like 70, 80%. And the question is, where's the public voice of the church? Where, where, where is our public witness? And the answer is, we're often so scared of getting it wrong and messing up. It makes sense that we don't do anything at all. I, I, I remember being in Pakistan a little while ago, and I met a guy who'd just become a Christian, and um, he'd been a Christian for two weeks when he was taken on his first trip to share his faith with someone else. And um, it didn't go as planned. Um, he was a one-week-old Christian. He got talking to some other guys who were non-Christian. And the police came, picked him up by the hair, um, and started shaking him, pulled his hair up by his roots. So as he was talking to me, his friend took his skull cap off, and you could see the two bald patches either side of his head, beat him unconscious, dragged him through the streets, and threw him in jail. Now, he's been a believer for a week. Okay? So his experience of becoming a Christian is having his hair pulled out, beaten unconscious, and thrown in prison. You think that might discourage the guy. When he comes to, he looks around in the prison cell, and he goes, hey, there are 47 people here who can't go anywhere. <laughs> so he says to them, hey, I learned some new songs this week. Can I sing them to you? So he sings the limited number of worship songs that he knows and hymns. And then he says, hey, I, I, I learned some, some, some real wisdom recently. You know, can I recite it to you? And the little bit of the Bible he knows, he recites to them. And then he starts sharing his testimony. And then he says, I'm going to pray for you. But before he prays for them, he spends some time just on his own waiting before the Lord. And as he's waiting on praying before God, he, he feels God say to him, I'm going to release you before 7 o'clock in the morning. So he opens up his eyes and says, look, I need to pray for all of you now. Because, because before, before it's 7 a.m., I'm going to be released from the prison. So he starts talking to all the prisoners and praying for them. And just before 7 o'clock, the head of the prison comes in into the jail. And he puts the key in the door. He unlocks it. And he points at this guy. And he says, I'm throwing you out of my prison. You're a troublemaker. <laughs> now, that is a very unusual excuse. That's why you normally put people into prison, right? That's not normally why you throw them out. At this point, the other prisoners grabbed him. And they said, you can't go until you finish praying for all of us. In most of the world, that's what it means to be prepared to be a public Christian. To stand up for your faith means you're putting your life on the line. When, when you get to heaven, you're going to meet these people, and they're going to say, what happened to you when you shared your faith? You know, I got beaten, tortured, and killed. And you're going to be like, well, it was a little bit embarrassing. And it, it didn't feel terribly English. So, I, you know, I, I, I didn't really say anything to anybody. I'm, you are not going to be happy with that answer on that day. When in 1 Peter... Paul, Peter writes to the church and says, you be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. you. You be ready to tell them what happened to you. When they obey that command, it could cost them their life. And so the question is, first of all, are we able to do it? Does make sense? If someone said to you, why are you a Christian? Could you explain why rather than just saying how? I mean, what is the answer? Why is it true? Could you do it? And, and, and the second thing is, is, are you willing to do it? Do you want to? If you're not in some way somehow living a public life with your Christian faith, you're probably missing out on so much that God wants to have for you. And I understand how impossible it seems. I, I remember having um, the opportunity of speaking to the board of a really major banking group in Asia a little few years ago. And, and um, the church that um, I was going to speak in that night said, look, we know you're speaking at this bank um, at, at lunchtime, and we're wondering... We're going to put a dinner on, and we're going to advertise it for the senior banking community in our country. And, and we, we don't know if anyone will come, but we'll try. We're going to have a jazz band. We're going to have a buffet. We're going to have um, this well-known chef cook and all this kind of stuff. And, and we'll invite people to come. And I said, look, I'd much rather try and fail than not try at all. I said, so if you're prepared to pray like crazy, I promise I'll prepare like pr pr crazy, and let's just see what happens. Anyway, what happened was there was a guy at the lunch meeting who took a lot of notes into his BlackBerry. And he started it out to some of his friends in the banking community, and it sort of went viral. So when I arrived at the church that evening, um, they, we, they, they said that they were, up, they, they, they were hoping they could get 240 people. 
And I said to them, look, even if we get 10, I'll just sit on the table and we'll just talk around the table. And as I arrived, they were rolling all the, all the um, um, tables out, uh, people carrying out tablecloths and table decorations and food. And I sort of sighed and I said, I stopped one of them. I said, has no one come? You know, I mean, like you've canceled everything. You're just, <laughs> everything's, you know. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. There are about a thousand people so far. So we've canceled dinner. We've canceled jazz. It's now going to be just you. And I was so disappointed because I, I love jazz. And I was just hoping that <laughs> at least there'll be some decent jazz to make the evening worthwhile. Well, that evening, we saw about 80 people give their lives to the, become Christians. And I sat down late at night in a hotel with um, someone who was visiting the country who'd come along with me to see what we do. And we're having a drink, and he said, I can't believe what happened today. He said, it's incredible. It's amazing. It's fantastic. And then he said, you must have people all the time begging you to come and do this kind of stuff. And I said, no, that, no, we don't. He said, what do you mean? I said, most people believe that what you just saw happen is impossible. It can't be done. And he went, that's me. He said, when I heard that you were going to go and speak to the board of this major global banking group, I th can remember thinking, what idiot set up this meeting? Whoever, whoever invited you in is going to get fired. And not only are they going to get fired, they're going to make it so embarrassing to be a Christian in the company, it's going to make it impossible for any Christian working in that place from this point on. And he says, and I can't believe what happened. And I said, if you can't believe what happened and you saw it with your own eyes, imagine now flying halfway around the world back home to where you're from and trying to convince people this is what they should be praying for. One of the reasons we have so little going on in this country in terms of sharing is we're not inviting people to come into our homes. And when we're in our workplaces or with the people that we spend most of our time with, we think it's not possible to talk to them. So we're not even praying for it. We have to be able to do it. That is what we're being invited to here. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. In other words, make sure Jesus is boss of your life. Okay? Make sure you're in the right place doing what he wants you to do. Secondly, get prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, that word prepared there um, ha has with it in its original language the idea of getting fit. Now, I've always dreamed of getting fit. It's been one of my lifetime goals. As you can see, not achieved. Um, um, I mean, I was so inspired as a teenager, particularly by one particular actor who I think scandalously has never been given an Oscar, despite his amazing body of work, or indeed just great body, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> But I remember watching, watching Arnold Schwarzenegger films growing up and thinking, I want to look like that. So I exercised for a whole week. <laughs> I stood in front of a mirror and no discernible difference. The idea of getting fit is it's difficult. It's very different to getting something like a degree. I mean, just out of interest, how many of you here have a degree? Just put up your hand if you have a degree. Right, now, keep your hand in the air if today you could resit the finals for your exams and still pass and keep your degree. Now, do you see how almost all the hands disappear? You see, the amazing thing with the university degrees is you go and often learn, learn a whole bunch of largely useless information, and then you go into the real world and you, you learn something useful, but you still keep the degree, even after you've forgotten everything. <laughs> but getting fit's very diff different, isn't it? You can spend three years training to get fit, and then you, you, you can't stop. It's not like you've achieved it and now you keep it for life, so you can drink as much pizza and beer as you want. You have to keep at it. When Peter says, you be prepared to talk to people about your Christian faith, he's anticipating something which is going to be hard work. You're going to have to get training. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to have, get people to help you. You're going to have to get people to teach you. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to make the investment. Uh, and again, I'll just, I haven't been asked to promote the, the vision course that's run through here, but that's part of the vision of it, Right? If you can't go right now, pay for someone else to go do it. All I can tell you is, in my opinion, there aren't enough people doing it right now, and there are millions of people asking questions. I was at Barclays Bank a couple of two, three days ago, speaking to a couple of hundred people there. The, the, the opportunities are just amazing right now. I was speaking to another big banking group. I have a sort of background in finance because I was interested in derivative trading and systemic risk to financial markets. And if you know what that means, congratulations. And I, I, I can remember... You know, I was speaking at a gold group with Goldman Sachs, the uh, Goldman Group uh, recently when Jim Wigglesworth was with me and this guy came bounding up at the end of the evening and said, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened. Can, it needs to be happening every week and we need to be doing this and we should organize some other ones. And so I thought he was one of the Christians in the bank who'd help organize this thing. So I said, are you part of the, of the, of the Christian group here that organizes? He said, no, no, I've never been to church in my life. I said, what do you believe? He said, I'm an atheist. And I was like, well, what do you think about tonight? He said, this is amazing. He says, everybody needs to hear this. This, is, this, this changes everything. 
There, there are people out there who, who are desperate. There was, I was speaking to another, um, I was speaking, um, I think it was Deloitte in, in London, and um, after talking to them about why integrity matters in business and what do you do when integrity fails, this, this woman, I said, any questions? And this woman puts up her hand and she said, as far as everyone's concerned, I'm, I'm incredibly successful in this firm. She said, but to be honest, I've been battling with suicide for the last three to four months. And she said, and this morning I woke up and I said, right, that's it. And as I was walking into work, I said, God, if you're there, I need to meet you today. Otherwise, I'm going to end my life tonight. And then she said, and you've just answered all my questions. She said, I'm ready. My question is, how do I become a Christian? So I said, well, who brought you here? And she said, well, this lady next to me, which is my friend. I said, well, look, let me tell you how you become a Christian. And I explained. And I said, why don't you talk with your friend while I answer some other questions? I answered some of the other questions, came back to her at the end. I said, how are you doing? She said, okay, I've just become a Christian. Now what do I do? Standing at the back of the room was one of the more senior man leaders in the firm who was thinking, come, come to check out what's this crazy thing that's happening in the workplace, because should it be allowed? And I went up to them at the end and just said, are you happy with what happened here tonight? And he said, yeah, he said, this is really changing people's lives. What you're doing is really important. We, we need to be open to just what is possible. We've, we've just lost a vision for the fact that we're surrounded by people who are people. They're people. We're people. We, we've got questions, we've got struggles, we've got doubts, we've got issues, we've got questions about meaning and purpose and identity, and we, wanna, we need to talk to people. And God's planning to use you. He's, you are his ambassador. He wants to use you. Now, let's just try to put some meat on the bones here, because it's one thing to say, look, we need to do this. And I'm, most of you are sitting here right now thinking two things, probably. I think this is beyond me, it's too difficult. And two, it's, it's just, it, you, you don't understand how difficult it is where I am. So if you've got a more difficult context than terrorist organizations or very hardcore secular organizations who think you're creating a fundamentally unsafe space by being allowed to do it in the first place, then I'd love to hear about it. But those are the two difficult groups I know about at the moment. But what is interesting is what Peter says, is he says, always be prepared to give an answer. And that word answer comes from this Greek word apologia, where we get the English word apologetics from. Now, if you know anything about this word, what you think of is, what that implies is you've got you need to be a professional question answerer. And that's not what this is about. It, it is true, people have questions and they're looking for answers. And as Christians, we have to put in the hard work to figure out what we're gonna say. But, but let me, let's, take, let's demystify this in two ways. First of all, go Pentecostal on me again. I want you to imagine the following situation, all right? I want you to imagine you're having coffee with a friend. If you don't have a friend, imagine you have a friend. And you and your imaginary non, you know, friend who isn't a Christian, you're, you're having a cup of coffee, which is obviously going to look weird, two cups of coffee on a table and just one person. But, you know, and, and, and imagine the conversation's going really well. I mean, like, don't I like really well? They, they, they ask you about you, and you start talking about you, and then you talk about some of the stuff you're involved in, and maybe even share a little bit about what you heard up here. And you, can, and you start sharing about, hey, you know, recently, uh, when I was at church, some, some people were sharing, I was really encouraged, and, like, and they're going, wow, that's amazing. I had, had no idea that, that God answered prayer. And it's going so well. And then all of a sudden, they go, wait a minute. And they look at you. And they say, what about this? And then they ask you a question that terrifies you. What is the question you would least like to be asked by someone who isn't a Christian? What is the question which, if asked, you would start praying for the second coming? Because Armageddon would be preferable to having to speak. <laughs> Come on, just shout some of them out. What is the question you would least like to be asked by someone who isn't a Christian? Why does God allow suffering? Right, why does God allow suffering? Another one. Why, right, if it's true, how come I haven't heard any of this before? Another one. What are you doing about it? Why is religion the biggest problem in the world? Do you believe in hell? Now, we could keep going, right? Now, how many of you are listening to these questions going, oh my goodness, I've never heard this question before? I mean, how many of you are sitting there thinking, wow, I never would have guessed they would have asked that. <laughs> you already know what the questions are even before you start talking to somebody. I mean, you already know what they are. Imagine you're applying for your dream job, okay? I don't know what your dream job would be. Astronaut, Pope, whatever it is, okay? <laughs> Imagine your dream job is on the table. And even before you send off your application form, the head of the select committee, of the, of the committee, the interview committee rings you up. And they say, hey, John, Samantha, whatever. I wa I'm going to make sure you get this job. And I, I want to help you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you every question. We have 36 questions that the panel are going to ask every candidate who's going to apply. And I'm going to send you all 36 questions now. Okay, so that come the interview in three months' time, you know, 
you know, you'll have some idea what's coming. Now, your dream job. You've just been given every question you're going to be asked. What are you going to spend the next three months doing? Okay. Uh, practicing answering them. Okay, so you're going to think through what you're going to say. What else might you do? Research. Okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? You might even rehearse them. You might sit someone down and say, look, I'm going to be asked all these questions. What, what do you think of this? Right? Hopefully, most of you are intelligent enough at this point to make the connection between the illustration and the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> you, you know what the questions are. They're not going to surprise you. It's highly unlikely they're going to say, what do you think about the latest shift in quantum theory and how that might actually relate to you know, sub-atomic sub, sub structure of randomness in terms of how the human brain operates? It's highly unlikely you're going to be asked that unless somehow you have a specialism in that field because, by and large, even in Oxford, people don't talk about that over coffee. So... So you know what the questions are. And number two, when you look at how Jesus did this, it is so earthy. In, when, when I became a Christian in the Middle East, um, I, um, uh, uh, first thing I did is I read through the whole Bible. Now, when, when, when people listen to me speak, they often think, where do you get your English accent from? You know, which part of England were you brought up in? Because they, they struggle to place my accent. And the answer is, this is the voice of the BBC World Service. Okay? Okay? I was living in Saudi Arabia. I listened to the BBC World Service. I love the BBC World Service. It is a fantastic radio program. The thing I hated most about it was when they interviewed political leaders, kings, sheikhs, presidents, prime ministers. Because the interviewer would ask this brilliant question, and then they would answer a different one. And then the interviewer would say, uh, you know, with respect, uh, prime minister, uh, the question I was asking you was this. And then they'd answer another question. And you sit there thinking, just answer the question for goodness sake, and sometimes I'll turn the radio off. So frustrating. So I'm a brand new believer, and I'm reading through the Gospels, and people come to Jesus, they ask him a question. Jesus responds with another question, and I'm sitting going, he's a politician. <laughs> this is awful. This is the worst thing that can happen. But when you look at those questions, you realize that Jesus Christ didn't avoid any questions. Now, we don't have time to run through the whole thing here, so if you want to run through the whole thing about learning to ask questions, come and speak to Jim Wigglesworth, who sat there, and the we'll send you a free link to a talk about it. Okay? But here's the thing. You will notice Jesus Christ asks about 147 questions in the New Testament. Most times when people come and ask him a question, he answers, asks a question of his own. Why does he do that? And the reason he asks the question is because, well, he wants people to think. He wants people to help see it clearly. He wants to help them understand. He's asked questions like, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus smiles and says, why do you call me good? Well, there's a good question. Have you ever been asked the granny question? Are you saying my good granny's going to hell? Well, what is a good granny? What does that look like? <laughs> Jesus asked the question to get the other person thinking even before he answers it. Then he answers the question, only God is good. Okay, so if you have to be good to go to heaven and only God is good, who is going? No one, apart from God. Your application to join the Trinity has been refused. You don't meet the minimum entry requirement. <laughs> so then the question is, well, how can anyone go? And the answer is forgiveness. That's how you get in. Forgiveness. We have to learn to ask questions. And all of us can learn to ask questions. That's, that's where it starts. Asking questions is what is the heart of any good conversation. And that's something, therefore, we all have to get really good at. And everyone in this room, all of you, can learn to ask good questions. You can all learn to ask the questions that help open people up and start them getting thinking about what they're thinking and talking about and actually open the door so that you can actually share the gospel with them. All of us can do that. And that's, that's the vision. We have to be prepared to sit down and think, what are the questions we should be asking? Don't worry about running in with the answers straight away. Stay way further back. What are the questions that would really help here? Uh, have any of you ever done anything like management consultancy, marriage counseling, something like that? Put up your hands. So my guess is you guys ask a lot of questions, right? Okay, let me ask you, why do you keep asking questions even when you know what the answer is? To engage them? to get their reaction, and to get them to think, so where? What do you want them to do eventually? For them to figure it out. Sometimes, 
Good teachers ask questions even when they know what the answer is, not because they don't know what the answer is. They're trying to get the other person just to slowly, slowly go, oh, and guess what? When they've learned the lesson that way, they're going to remember it forever. Jesus Christ asks so many questions. He's not playing games with people. He's taking them on a journey. And then when he's asked the question, then normally comes the story, the parable, that makes them go, wow, that changes everything. I want to I wanna pray for you because I say there's one piece that we haven't talked about today that we haven't even addressed, that we're going to address tonight. So you, it will be online. You'll be able to listen to it. Because there is this other question about causing offense. We now live in a culture where we fear that even asking the question can be offensive. And so then we then have to then rethink through how do we engage in that well? And how do we actually think through that piece? So I don't want to minimize this and say, look, there's never going to be any difficulty. But I'll just share one last practical thing that I, I, I had to learn very early on. When I, when I was often talking with people and using this new radical way of doing evangelism called talking, I would, I would often look at their face. And I'm not an expert at reading body language, but I quickly learned that if you're talking to somebody and they start going, <laughs> that even though they're not speaking, they may not be agreeing with you. And, and, and so I would often look at them and, and think, are you interested? And, are you? And, and, then, and then I would sometimes just stop and say, C can I ask what you just heard me say? And they would say, well, that you're saying this, 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 and this. And here was the amazing thing. Nine times out of ten, I would have to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm obviously not a very good communicator. I was trying to say something very different to that. And 99 times out of 100, they would reply and say, oh, what were you trying to say? I had to learn to be good at apologizing for when I wasn't clear. And 99 times out of 100, they would then come back and give me a second chance. What were you trying to say? And I'll say, well, it's, it's different. And, that, that, and I'll try a different way. And then, and then when it connected, I think, oh, that seemed to work. I'll try to remember that. If you're willing to apologize and you're willing to say sorry, you'll be amazed at what can happen. You can learn from all of your mistakes. Asking questions clarifies the question. It clarifies what you're talking about. It defines the words that you're using. It does everything that you need it to do in order to help you to share the gospel effectively. And you'll be amazed at some of the conversations you can actually have. In Christ, we have the only hope to actually change and transform a totally broken world. He can change everything. He can change every human heart. When um, Jim and I were um, speaking to one of these difficult militant groups a couple of months ago, they wanted to talk about politics and they wanted to talk about land ownership. It was the number one question. Who was here first? Who owns the land? We have the right to kill the people on our land. And so I'm praying and I'm saying, please, Lord, just give me the opportunity here for a question. And they... they suddenly said something, and I sat up, and I thought, oh, great. So I smiled, and I said, you know what? You have to delete this reference, too. I said, I, I was meeting with one of the leaders, and I said, he asked me a difficult question. Can I ask you the question he asked me? And they were like, okay. So I say, oh, well, here's the question he asked me. So I asked them the question that I'd been asked, and they answered it. And then I said, you know, Jesus Christ answered that question. And they said, he did. I said, would you like to hear his answer? Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, after an hour and a half of conversation, the leader in the room turns to his acolytes and says, this is what real love is. He says, this is what real forgiveness is. This changes everything. And it was the most amazing opportunity. We've been asked to go back, so we're going to go back in a couple of months' time. I'm hoping it's not a one-way invitation. But you could see in their eyes, now all of a sudden, something that they'd never heard before. And as I walked out, I've got a little video on my phone. It's 44 seconds long. I'd, I'd love to show it if I could. But you will see this guy from the country with this huge, big, toothy grin. After we walked out going, wow. He says, wow. He says, this is amazing. He says, I can't believe what we just said. That is amazing. And now, guess, guess what he wants to spend his life doing? He's already, he's now offering to take us to some of the most crazy places in the planet. And we're like, whoa, 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 okay. <laughs> you know, we can't see all of these groups and it's probably not wise to. But 
the heart is there. Step out in faith. You might be missing what you're most missing. In Oxford, we run this training program, and one of the things we do is we also try to train people involved in business, and they're not all from the same business and background. And um, a few years ago, a guy applied whose business background was different to any of the others we've had on our five-week training program, because um, he was 17 and a half years in the SAS, seven years in the paras before that, 17 and a half in the SAS, and his last job was doing covert operations in Afghanistan. And so I was interviewing him, saying, why do you want to do the program? And he said, I, I, I would like, he said, I, I, I would like to, to do what you're talking about. He says, when I was in the SAS, he said, there was nothing I wouldn't do to achieve the mission I'd been given. He said, I was part of a close-knit community, and we were totally committed. He said, there was no hardship we wouldn't endure. There was no difficulty we weren't prepared to overcome. There was nothing we weren't prepared to go through in order to do what we'd been asked to do. He said, now I've become a, a follower of Jesus Christ. The mission that God has given me is more important than anything any government has ever asked of me. He said, but where's the commitment in the church? He said, where's the willingness to endure hardship? He says, where's the willingness to train yourself and put yourself in a position to do what you have to do? He says, I, 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 that's what I want. He says, I'd like to be trained and I'd like to go to some of these places with you. So he came along and he did the training. And then I said to him, look, I'm going to this difficult country. Why don't you come with me? And he said, yep, I'll come. And as we're standing in, in passport control, you know, waiting to go through security, um, when, after we've landed, I turned to him and I said, have you been to this country before? And he said, yeah, but I've never been through passport control. <laughs> um, it's like a halo drop from a very high height. And we were there for a week. And now a week later, we're on the plane and we're, and we're flying back. And I turned to him and I say, was it worth it? The sacrifice you made, all the money you've invested, all the training you, you know, to do, was it worth it? I don't know about you, I always find it very moving when I see these incredibly dedicated military guys just well up with tears. And he just welled up with tears. He said, this is what I've been waiting for. He says, this is what I want, I want to give my life to. So I don't want to just be part of a church and just come alongside. I said, I want to give myself everything. I want to be involved with something that will make a difference. This helps me make a difference. It's been worth every penny. You might be picking your own pocket by not making the sacrifice, making the commitment, making the investment to put yourself in a position where you can serve in a way that might actually thrill your heart and take you to a whole new level in your walk with him. It could be the most satisfying thing you ever do, and I would urge you, throw yourself into it. Don't stand on the outside. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you've been dragged along because someone promised you it would be interesting and you're planning to pick them up for lying to you and their general lack of integrity. <laughs> I would urge you, don't don't give up on the Christian faith because you've seen some kind of weak, fake version of it somewhere else. Find a place where people have completely given themselves to this, where they actually know the reality and the truth of it, and they're living it. It will change you completely. Can I pray for you as we just wrap up here? How long have I been talking for? Okay, let's start with a prayer of confession. Lord, I'm sorry that I talked for too long. But Lord, I want to pray for every person in this room, old, young, Father, right across the spectrum. Lord, you know each one by name. Lord, you have a purpose for every single person in this room, whether it's with a next-door neighbor, whether it's in a business, whether it's in a neighboring town, a neighboring country, or on the other side of the world. You have a purpose for every single person here. And Lord, I want to pray, Father, Lord, that you would speak and inspire each one here to realize what it is that you're asking of them. Lord, teach us again that our prayers make a difference and can change history. Lord, teach us again that you've put a calling on our life and you want us to stand and speak for you, however small it may be. Because, Lord, we know sometimes these tiny little mustard seeds grow into these huge trees. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, for each one here, Lord, that they may find that with you. Lord, I ask that all of the questions that we so often ask that stop us sometimes doing what you'd have us do is too hard, the timing isn't good, it's not convenient. Lord, will you help us to to lay aside those things when they're not true. Lord, to fully lay hold of what you have for us in Christ. And Lord, I pray, Father, indeed our hearts may be full. Lord, because of the way that we walk and spend time with you. And Lord, we just long to see you move in our family, in our city, Lord, in our workplace, in this country. Lord, we just want to be a part of it. Lord, show us, Lord, where and what you are asking of us. Lord, help us to do it. And Lord, we know the only safe place to be is where you want us to be. Lord, help us to be there with you in Christ's name. Amen.